Well, hello there, and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show. I'm actually really kind of having a girlfriend jam on this episode with Lisa Bilyeu, who is the co-founder of Quest Nutrition. This is so amazing. This company, Quest Nutrition, grew at 57,000% in its first three years. She's also the co-founder and president of Impact Theory Studios, a revolutionary digital first studio that produces wildly entertaining original content focusing on themes of empowerment. I met Lisa because she had me on her show, Women of Impact, talking about my Boundary Boss book, and we just kind of fell in girlfriend love with each other. She has such a, um, she has such an infectious personality of joy. And the book that she has that is coming out right now that is actually already out, it's all about radical um, confidence and basically how to get it. How did she get it? So it's the name of the book is Radical Confidence, 10 No BS Lessons on Becoming the Hero of Your Own Life. It dropped two days ago and I really, really enjoyed this because it's her 10 No BS Lessons on Becoming the Hero of Your Own Life, but it's also a memoir. And we are really getting the inside scoop on how she transformed her life that was not working for her into one that is really, really working for her and how you can too. So I really hope that you enjoy this girlfriend jam with Lisa as much as I enjoyed hanging out with her. I'm super excited to welcome Lisa to the show. Hi, Lisa. Come on in. Oh my God. Thank you so much, Terry, for having me. This is so super exciting. We were just talking before we were actually on camera about like what, what changes in life when you write your first book, you don't realize it until you write your first book, <laughs> what goes into pre-selling and selling a friggin' book, correct? Yes. It's so overwhelming. And like, I, when I say overwhelming, I love it. Like it really forces me to think outside the box and do th new, diff new and different things, which I love because I used to have a life where there was no excitement. There was no challenge. And I just lived each day, you know, saying, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, I'm okay. And so now having been there, knowing that, you know, being challenged makes me stronger. I get so excited, even though I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> But, but what, what I think is so amazing and what comes through so much in the content of this book that, by the way, I love so much. So just saying kudos to you as this is your first sort of foray. I love what you chose and, and it's so you, it's like you telling your story. So for those of you, you heard me say it at the top, this book, you can buy it right now anywhere. It's called Radical Confidence, 10 No BS Lessons on Becoming the Hero of Your Own Life. It literally dropped two days ago. Get on this bandwagon, people. You can buy it everywhere. Anyway, moving into, I want to ask you, before we get into some of the No BS lessons, what, why now? Why now for this book? Oh, that's a really good question. I think that having been stuck for eight years in a life where I gave up my hopes and my dreams, and I never felt like I had the right or the confidence to ask mm -hmm. for a different life. And because of what's happened in the world over these last two years, where something has really come in and shaken us up, I understand that so many people are fearful. People are fearful into stepping into new arenas. The uncertainty of the world can be so scary. And I already deal with my, you know, the, my own fear of my, the voice in my head that's telling me I'm not good enough. And I'm, you know, I don't have the right to go after my dreams. So now if I'm already battling my mind and now in society, the world is already battling what is happening. I really feel like it's come to a point where we need to look at the realities of our situation and say to ourselves, are we actually living the life we want? Because so often we, we say, I'm fine, right? Because we want to please our partners or please our family or please, you know, our society who has um, put expectations upon us that we've taken. So I think it's really important to stop breaking that, start having the dialogue of, it's not up to me what life you want, but do you have it and are you working towards it? And if the question is no, then that's why the book is here to help. It's not to say you don't have the fear. It's not to say, you know, <laughs> you can have any life you want and it's easy. Um, but it is really <laughs> addressing like the real lessons I had to learn along my journey. Oh my God, so good. So, so let's start with this whole eight year 
situation and, and how your upbringing impacted that time period. So just tell us a little bit about sort of the the housewife years, shall we? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for setting that up. So being brought up as a Greek Orthodox, I had like big dreams of coming from England. I loved Los Angeles. I was the one, the kid getting up at three in the morning to watch the Oscars. And it was just, it wasn't expected. It wasn't the normal. And so growing up, every time I would say my dreams or my hopes or like my desire to be in Hollywood, I would literally get like patted on the head and be like, oh, that's a big dream for a little girl like you, you know? And mm. I got that messaging. I got the messaging from my grandmother being very traditional Greek Orthodox where little things like I would skim my knee right as a kid and she would come running over and she'd like be like oh it's okay it's okay you're gonna be okay by the time you get married that was her cons like literally every time <laughs> I was upset she would consult me by saying but you're gonna be fine by the time you get married now just it's funny, right? But think about what that's doing to like this young, impressionable little girl who doesn't feel good about herself and is being told subliminally all along the way that don't worry, as long as you make it to marriage, that's the end goal. So we flash forward. I meet the man of my dreams. I fall in love. We have these big dreams about making it in movies. But the thing that I had been taught all along starts to, you know, habit is very... um habit is inevitable sometimes and so my habit started to really come out into like even though it wasn't something i wanted the habit of taking care of my husband felt normal it felt good it felt well oh i was supposed to do this anyway and so in our search to try and get enough money to make movies that was the original plan let's just make like make enough money to make movies and so as a supportive wife I said to my husband, okay, you go out on a day, daily basis, you try and make the money and I'll be the great supportive wife and I'll make all other decisions for you because we'd seen an interview with Steve Jobs and he said he doesn't use his brain power on anything that isn't important. So something like what he wears, he's like, why would I make, you know, spend any energy on that? So that's why he always just wore jeans and a black top. So he mm -hmm. didn't have to make any decisions. So me and my husband played the no BS game, what would it take? So it's no BS, what would it take to do this? And so we played the game, what would it take to actually make movies that we finance? And that's where we came to that conclusion. You go out, you spend all your energy on making money and I'll support you. Now what happened was the habit takes over, the mindset takes over, everything that I had been told growing up starts to take over and I didn't realize it. And this is what I call in the book, the purgatory of the mundane. I have it. I literally have the entire passage <laughs> copy and pasted into my notes because I was like, oh my God, can I, I'm just going to read two, two lines from this. The purgatory of the mundane is like an inner tube pool floaty, easy to get into, even relaxing at first. But then it's really freaking hard to get out of, especially when you're trying desperately not to spill your drink or get your braids wet. <laughs> The purgatory of the, the mundane motto is, it's not that bad. And it isn't that bad, but believe me, it's a sinister trick to fall for. So, and, and you go on from there, but I found the whole concept so brilliant because at least one of the points that you make in the intro and in the beginning of the book is that these things don't, they don't devolve or evolve mm -hmm. overnight. Mm -hmm. You were like, this was a slow burn in purgatory, not realizing you originally with Tom had agreed I'll do this for a year or two. Yeah. And then you're coming upon how long was it actually? So tell us more about the purgatory. Yeah. The mundane. Thank you. Though, Cause so that was the thing. It was like, okay, I can do this for a year. I can be a supportive wife for a year. It's all for the greater good, the greater good. How many of us say that I'm going to do, I'm going to give up a year of my life for this thing. And what ended up happening was I was stuck in a perpetual pattern of, you know, when, when this happens, then I'm going to make movies. When my husband is happy, then I'll make movies. When we have enough money, then we'll make movies. And there was always a when around the corner. And so what was I using as that when uh, to keep my mind occupied? It becomes what I refer to in the book as the squirrels, right? Like, have you ever seen that movie, the animation, right? Where the squirrel is like, I'm at the dog with the squirrel. And um, we use distractions and I was using yeah. slow, small distractions to numb me from the fact that my life was just mundane enough. 
I didn't hit rock bottom. And I don't know how many incredible humans you've met that actually hit rock bottom. And that's where they make their change, right? Because they're like, well, I don't have anything else to lose. Now, what about the hundreds of millions of us that don't hit rock bottom? And now we don't make a change because we don't hit the rock bottom. So our life is just mundane enough. We tell ourselves that we're doing it for the greater good. So we convince ourselves and then we use squirrels to distract us from the core unhappiness that we're feeling. So, so amazing. And what I think is so brilliant about the, the whole way that it's positioned is that it happens. So, um, it, it's insidious. Yeah. Because you're right. In the book you share, like if someone hits rock bottom, you're kind of like the universe has seriously thrown you down a flight of stairs. So mm-hmm. you have to sort of change something. With this, and I've really identified, and I know so many of my listeners and people watching this on YouTube will as well, identify with the feeling of being ungrateful. Yes. Like nothing's wrong with my life. What am I complaining about? Am I selfish? Am I greedy? Am I all of those things? Yes, Terry, literally this haunts me because I'm all about (laughs) what is the tactic that I can use to help me in this situation? And I I think I like that in my entire life with everything I deal with. And so when I was feeling badly, when I was, you know, that home, stay at home wife for like a year, a year and a half, two years, I started to like going like, oh God, is this my life? Now in moments (laughs) like that, I think when we're thinking negatively, it is a beautiful thing to use gratitude in your life to remind you of all the beautiful things. I don't think thinking negatively will serve you. And so staying there also keeps people stuck, keeps people with a victim mentality. So I'm always, how do I flip this? So I used gratitude and I was like, well, hang on a minute. I'm really grateful for having a husband that loves me. You know what? I'm really grateful for having a roof over my head. Now, when you do that in the first year, because you've got a game plan, you know what you're doing, you know why you're doing it, it's not a bad thing. But you tell me at year six, where now (laughs) I'm using gratitude, where I'm saying, but Lisa, how ungrateful are you? You want to complain that you're a stay-at-home wife? And look, I want to stay, being a stay-at-home wife, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it if that's your dream. Like, I want to applaud people that choose it and love it. With me, it wasn't the life I chose, and yet I ended up there. So so I just want to make sure that that's very, like, emphasized here. And so when I looked at my life and I was like, oh God, I am utterly miserable. I can't believe this is my life. I was still using gratitude. And so I was like, but Lisa, how ungrateful are you? Because you have a husband that loves you. You know how many people (laughs) don't have that? You know, Lisa, you're so ungrateful because you're saying you want to go out and do something different. And you're in a position where you don't have to work. You know how many people struggle and that gratitude stopped me from asking for more. And what I realized is, girl, we can be freaking all over the moon in love with certain areas of our lives and be proud of them. And yet at the same time, we have every right to look at other parts of our life where we're unhappy and miserable and still demand a better existence. And I didn't do that. And that's where I think so many of us get stuck because we think if we're grateful for one thing that we then, we will appear ungrateful for the other things that don't align with us. Yes. And it's giving yourself, and it's so clear in the book, giving yourself permission to be honest with yourself because you're like, how are you going to make manifest your dreams if you can't, don't even have the courage to admit to yourself Like these are really the things I want to do and I'm not doing them. Yeah. So, um, let's talk a little bit about the imposter syndrome, which you also hit in the book. Tell me your thoughts, feelings, fears. If people are feeling the imposter syndrome, because as a therapist, I could tell you, my friend, anyone who's ever done anything or done nothing has had this experience (laughs) with the imposter syndrome feeling like can't be me. Like I, I, who am I? to write a friggin' book or who am I to whatever the thing is. So tell me your experience. All right. I love this so much. And I want to make sure that people actually know who Lisa Billu is. When I got offered my book deal about a year and a half ago, at that point, I'd already built a billion dollar company. I'd already built impact theory where we have over 500 million views in our ecosystem. We've got almost 8 million people in our ecosystem as well. So I want to give people context. And a year and a half ago, when someone came to me and offered, my literary agent came and offered me a book. 
The very first words out of my mouth, well, first of all, I just ignored my husband. I was like, oh, that's sweet. And he's like, but babe, someone's actually approached you. Like, you need to consider this. And I literally just blew it off. I was like, oh, that's very nice, babe. Thank you. He's like, why are you being so nonchalant? Like, this isn't like you. And the first words out of my mouth were, well, who would buy a book from me? <laughs> now, you see me a year and a half later, that same person that is sitting here promoting my book. That's... And it was this weird inception that as I wrote the book, I wrote it about how to not have confidence in doing something. So I'm like, I'm using this in real time. <laughs> like, what am I, what is this skill set that I'm using now? Great, I need to add this to the book because I have no idea what I'm doing. And that's the point. Right, so I wanted to give people context about um, me having the imposter syndrome about being an author. So that's me sitting here talking about my book and me talking about imposter syndrome. So the truth is, I don't think... Um, it's necessarily always gone. I don't necessarily pride myself or look at myself as like, am I perfect? So if there are moments <laughs> where I feel the imposter syndrome, I'm like, cool, this is natural. And so I give myself, you've said it before, permission and grace. Those are the two words you'll hear me say a lot. Like I give myself permission and grace to have the imposter syndrome. And I also give myself the, um, the grace to be honest about, hang on a minute, well, your imposter syndrome, maybe it's telling you something. And what is that actually telling me? It's telling me, Lisa, you don't know how to write a book. Well, she's right. Like the voice in my head is actually right. <laughs> like I don't know how to write a book. So actually it's not even an imposter. It's an, an accurate syndrome. Like I don't know what other words right. we could use. But that's the thing is that imposter syndrome, even the word or the feeling can be crippling. But if we can actually reframe it and say, well, maybe the voice, I call it the voice in my head, maybe the voice mm -hmm. in your head is just trying to tell you something. And now instead of, can I swear on this podcast? You can. Okay, I can be polite. So instead of the mean girl in your head, I'll use polite words. So instead of the mean girl mm -hmm. in your head, what if she became your best friend? And so that's how I've pivoted. So even with imposter syndrome, it's like if the mean girl in my head is telling me, hey, you've got imposter syndrome, don't do it, you don't know what you're doing. I actually pause and I allow her to talk to me. And in that talking mm. to me, I'm like, oh, you're saying an imposter, what are you worried about? And in listening to the voice, she's telling me, like I said, you don't know how to write a book. And I say, thank you, friend, because we all want the truth from our friend, right? We don't just want our friend to be there to make ourselves feel better. We actually want the truth. And so if I'm see her as my BFF. And I can say, thank you, friend, for telling me. You're right. I actually don't know anything about a book. So now what you've done is you've helped me get better. And what you're telling me is I need to prepare. And so now yeah. I shift from the person that used to get petrified and paralyzed by the imposter syndrome and now is able to actually use it as my freaking superpower. And now yeah. I've just learned from her and now I'm able to move forward. But you're also, you know, in the, the, the chapter, right, is, you know, make your, your inner voice, your bitch and your BFF, yeah. which I loved. You're really also listening to the voice, but, but with, um, for, from a, a critical thinking point of view, we don't just buy it hook, line and sinker mm -hmm. because the story didn't end there. You're, you're right, right? Anyone who hasn't written a book before, all of us who first do it go, you are correct. I have not done it. I do not know how to do it. But the real question and so much of what this book and why it was so inspiring for me is it's about what are you willing to do? Mm. Are you willing to learn how to write a book? Are you willing to sit down and face that blank page? Clearly here we are. Your book just came out. <laughs> the answer for you was yes. The answer for me was yes as well, but it's not being paralyzed. And part mm -hmm. of what is so inspiring is you can move past the moment of who, you know, you don't know how to write a book to, oh, I can learn yeah. how to write a book and I have friends and I will reach out and I'll make myself vulnerable and I will talk to my husband and I will do all of these things. But your story, it's so, so interesting. There's like this parallel process that's going on in the book. We're getting to know you, your story, your cultural background, how your father grew up in Cyprus and, you know, like a real worked his way up, like actually from the bottom, you know, you hear people talk about like they worked their way up. You're like, no, he actually was like the male guy and then became the head of the thing. So you saw mm -hmm. this, this process, um, happening. So you understood 
in a way, hard work, and that mm-hmm. if you were going to have something happen, you were going to create it yourself. But what I find so fascinating from a psychological point of view, not to be a therapist, but I don't know how not no, to be. No, I love it. Yeah, this is the best part. <laughs> about d- the differentiation. You, 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 you tell a story about you were fighting with your dad about your, what you were going to study in university. Yeah. Yeah. And they wanted you to do something that was more practically applied in life. And you did not want to do that. And eventually after two weeks of fighting, your father was like, fine, study what you want. And he said, without malice, yeah. it's important that we add the without malice, yeah. um, you're going to get married and have kids anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And again, like I really got when, when you wrote in the book, like he wasn't saying it to like be a jerk. Yeah. Like this was your father's reality because marriage and a family and children and all of those things that was according to your grandmother and your culture, the end goal. Mm-hmm. So for you, how was that differentiating of that stepping out of, there was this expectation of you being a Greek Orthodox daughter to then being where you are now. So can you share a little bit of that journey with us? Yeah, thank you so much. So yeah, I mean, my dad's coming from, I mean, tiny village where his toilet was a hole in the floor. So it's like always, one of the biggest things that I've learned is understanding and meeting people where they are. It literally became game changing for me. Like understanding and not taking things personally from that perspective actually allowed me to take ownership over my actions and not treat everyone like an expert over my own life. You know, because it's like I can look at my dad and go, okay, well, he's been married and he's got experience and he, you know, he's got business and he understands so much more and he's way wiser than me, you know, and so maybe he's right. Or the opposite, you dismiss people. But I just go, well, why do they have this opinion in the first place? Like, let me just start there because you have to know who is actually the expert in these fields. And then also, even if they're an expert, does it sit well with you? So with my dad, it was like, I understand why my dad ended up saying, well, it doesn't really matter what you study because his mum literally learned to read by reading the Bible. She didn't go to school. Like didn't even go to high school, primary school. I'm not even sure what you guys call it, but like none of that. She Mm -hmm. learned to read by reading the Bible. His sister didn't go to school. There was only a few little young kids that were chosen from the village to get an education. And it was never a woman. It was always a um, a boy because there was no contraception. So, right. So if you like really backtrack and go, well, okay, this is why they believed that because there was no contraception. So a woman was going to basically fall pregnant once she had her arranged marriage at the age of 16. So understanding why my dad said that is so imperative. And the reason why it's imperative is we all hold a certain belief system right now of the way our lives are going to be. And the question is, does it actually align with who you are? I never questioned it. I never questioned it to the point where I kind of make a joke, but it's a little heartbreaking where I was 21 years old. I go on a date with my husband and on that very first date, out of utter curiosity, there was no malice involved, but he was like, oh my God, I was your Greek Orthodox. Why do you believe in God? And in that moment, the only answer I had was because my dad told me to. At 21, you know, and so that is just a great, beautiful, funny reflection of how we think about things and sometimes don't Mm -hmm. even question them. So... The reason why I really wanted to start there, and thank you so much for bringing that up, is to under, then understand why you end up in certain situations you end up in and then how to change them. Because that's what the book is about, right? Are you living the life you want right now? If the answer is no, how do you pivot? It all starts with actually assessing the way you believe in things and what you believe in and if they actually serve you, yes or no. And so for me, as I started to really, you know, I got thrown into a a small startup company that happened to have been Quest Nutrition that grew at 57,000%. And so it was in that growth. It was in that growth that I started to think about my life question my belief system, go, hang on a minute. I said, I wanted four children when I got married, but do I actually want children? Like I didn't even question if I wanted children or not, because it didn't, it didn't even occur to me that I could ask myself the question if I could not have children. So 
it all starts with kind of, you know, coming back around to your question. It really does start with establishing how you believe, what you believe in, and then seeing if it actually aligns with that dream and life you want. It's, it's so interesting though. How did your family, so, so you have um, unapologetically decided not to have children and how did all of this go down with your Greek Orthodox family? Yes, it wasn't easy. <laughs> I'm sure that's no <laughs> surprise to you. Um, and it was like, a, it was a really slow process. And I really do take people through the book, you know, with the mm -hmm. no BS ways of how you, I handled it. Because with things like that, where I decided I didn't want children, where I decided I didn't want to be a stay at home wife anymore. I want to go out and work. How do you articulate that? First of all, to your partner, and then to your rest of your family who all feel like they have invested in your future, right? It's like my mom, all she ever wanted in her entire life was to be a grandmother, like her entire life. So now imagine you're told that time and time again growing up. It's like mm. hard to address even within yourself. So it starts as a whisper. It starts as that little whisper that we all want to ignore, where we're just like, oh no, it's not there, it's not there. And then it's something in the book, uh, chapter that I call open the can of worms and embrace the ick. It's about asking yourself, the can of worms is the hard questions. Mm -hmm. And so many of us don't wanna ask ourselves the hard questions because there's so much ick that comes along with answering it. So for instance, me saying to myself, do I actually want children? comes along a whole host of problems. The fact that I have to talk to my family, the fact that I have to tell my husband, the fact that what if they don't accept it? The fact that what if my husband wants to get a divorce? What if this was a deal breaker for him? What if my mom, you know, um, really breaks down? Like there's so much that comes along with a decision. So anyway, the, the voice in my head started off as a whisper. It started to get louder and louder. I loved my life. I loved where I was going with business. Quest was growing so quickly that I just dove in and loved the challenge. And so as time went on, I realized I don't know if I want the life that I said I wanted. And so the first thing is I have to assess what that means to me. So I had to process my belief system and if it aligned with me, why I thought about it. So let's take kids, for instance. I was like, okay, I want kids. And just questioning it, I was like, well, why do I think I want kids? And give myself the space, the grace to just write down things and even go, well, what the hell does that mean? And that's exactly what mm -hmm. I did. The first thing I wrote down was legacy. And I was like, what the hell does legacy mean? People keep telling me I should have children for legacy, but I don't actually know what that means. Okay, I think in my heart, it means being remembered when I'm gone. Okay, now I've established what that means to me. And now I have to ask, does that mean I have to have children to have legacy? <laughs> and the answer is no. Mm -mm. The content I create, the book, everything I do. Okay, this actually fills in the legacy. Great. Now what's the next thing? So start really breaking down what that belief system is. If it actually aligns with how you think and what you want in life. And then coming to a decision that's right for you. Because that was the thing. I wasn't able to talk to anyone until I had established how I was feeling about it. So once I'd established how I was feeling about it, then I had to think about how I was going to talk about it with my husband. I wanted to have his perspective, how he felt, because it's not just me. It, obviously, he's the sure. other you know, half of the coin when it comes to this. So how he felt, giving him space to be honest, mm -hmm. with all emotions, giving him time to... Um, I actually say this in the book, like once we had spoken about it and actually gone through it, we both had to grieve the woman, wife and mother I thought I was going to be. Yep. And we both did that. And we had to do that in our own way because I still love the idea of having a baby grow inside me. Like I could get giddy. So it's not, you know, kind of going back to what we were saying earlier. It's like, just because you're excited about one thing in your life doesn't mean that you're not, you know, unhappy with other things. And so what I decided in that moment is I don't want children, but that doesn't mean I'm not heartbroken that I've decided not to have kids. Yep. And so I have to grieve that. I have to grieve the mother I thought I was going to be, even though it's the right decision for me. And so my husband also had to grieve. We had to go through like this um, transition process where I was taking care of him every single moment of the day. 
And so my suggestion was to him, hey, babe, let's work through this together. What if I wean you off me taking care of you? So we go (laughs) from I put your clothes out and cook for you seven days a week. We go to six. Then the next week we go to five. And the next week we go to four. So that ended up being this great, beautiful um, dance that we did on like accepting each other for who we are, accepting each other for the changes we're going through and then helping each other. But the last part was really telling my family and, you know, you're the freaking boundary boss queen. And it's like, (laughs) I actually had to start sending, setting boundaries with my mom because I told her I broke her heart. I saw her cry. And then two weeks later, she asks me again, when am I having kids? Mm -hmm. And it's (laughs) like, then when someone does that and you've made a decision, My mom loves me more than life itself. So it had nothing to do with how much my mom cared about me, but it absolutely had to do with my mom not accepting my decision. Right. And so I had to be very honest with her and go, okay, she's hurting right now. So maybe that's why she can't accept it. Mm -hmm. But in her keep asking me, it feels like she's crossing a boundary with that I feel like I have set on this is my decision and this is what I'm doing. And now it feels like you don't respect that boundary and you're trying to persuade me. Yep. Yeah, it feels like e- even if the, even if love is sort of the driving force, Why? it's hard to... You, you don't want to be manipulated by others and you can't live your life. What I love so much about the messaging in this book and the steps that you share is like we can't really live our lives in the service of other people's happiness if it does not also make us happy. Yeah. Because eventually then we become resentful, martyred, bitter, angry, mad, and blaming. And like you said at the top, mm. like it, it leaves us sort of lingering in the purgatory of victimhood where we feel like, well, I can't because I can't break my mother's heart, so to speak. And what you really had to do is make a decision of like, what is actually right for my one and only life this time around on earth? And do I think that my relationship with my mother will survive Mm -hmm. me choosing what's right for me? And clearly the answer is yes, it it can, it does, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I had to go in it, you know, obviously my mom responded, um, she was very heartbroken and we had some back and forths and, you know, to me it was about clarity and really expressing to her why it was impacting me and why it was bothering me, but showing no dismissiveness to how she felt. I think that's also very important. Um, mm-hmm. you know, because I do want a long-term relationship with my mom, but the key here is I always, I now process the worst case scenario and make sure I'm okay with it. And that Mm -hmm. is one thing that I find very helpful and beautiful. So like with my dad, where my husband literally goes to him and asks for his blessing in marriage. Mm -hmm. And my dad said, no, you know, Tom had already, (sighs) Tom had already thought through it. And he said, like, I'm not asking for permission. I'm asking for his blessing. And with that (laughs) mindset, that's what he said when he walked in. And when my dad said, no. He said, I respect you so much, Andreas, but I need you to know I'm still going to ask your daughter to marry me. And I just wanted your blessing. I understand that you can't give it right now. So he was very respectful. And so it was being very clear (laughs) on the acts. And so even with me, with my mom, it's like walking into that situation with utter respect for the other person, if you want the relationship, of course, and having grace, but knowing that their opinion isn't going to sway you. And that's why I had to personally do all the work myself before I told anybody, because I was worried if I haven't gone, got firm in my own decision, then I'm going to easily be swayed. They're going to press a trigger button or a soft spot mm-hmm. or a weakness in me, right? Where that, like, maybe that voice in my head is saying, but Lisa, are you okay with never having, you know, a baby grow inside you? Let's just say that's my thing, right? And it's mm-hmm. like, are you okay? Now, let's say I haven't decided, yes, I'm okay with it. And now I have that discussion and someone brings it up and that's my weak spot because I haven't actually decided I'm not actually okay with it. That's where right. I think you break down and you like, oh yeah, okay, maybe you're right. And so for yep. me, that's where I had to go with knowing it, making a decision, having the worst case scenario, this person may not approve but still having a game plan to know how you're going to move forward so that you don't allow external expectations, um, external opinions to dictate your life. Yes, it, it may make so much sense. So really, you guys listening, watching, if you would like 
radical confidence, if you really want to know yourself, if you are looking for a step-by-step -step guide to move from where you are at this moment in time to where you want to be without watering down or dumbing down your dreams, right? Whatever they may yeah. be, this book is for you. And what is exciting is that people can still come to the free one day confidence building party. We're at, you're having an event on the 14th, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, I'm doing a RadCon live event. Thank you. I'm so excited about this because I'm always thinking, girl, like how do we collectively really impact? And there's so many different areas, I think, of our lives, right? There's, um, as, as we talk about boundaries, being a boss, being a wife, being a daughter, being a friend, mm -hmm. like there's so many things that we deal with on a day to day. And so the live event is basically taking some of my really close friends and showcasing how we become radically confident in multiple areas of our lives from relationships to health to self care. Um, so yeah, I'm doing a free live event. I'm so excited. I'm already signed up. I'm so pumped. So tell, tell everyone where they can get the book. We know, but tell us anyway, and then tell us how to sign up for Radcon. Thank you so much. So yes, for the live event, you can go radconlive.com. Um, that's where all the, all the information is there. And again, you can join live for free and then to pre-order the book or to order the book, I should say, um, you can go to radicalconfidence.com. This was so much fun. I'm so excited for you. I'm so proud of you. I really, really loved the book. I think it is a great handbook for people who are like, where do I go from here? Here you go. Here's step one. So I will see you at RadCon Live. And you guys, all the information that you need to pick up Lisa's book, you're going to love it, is all in the show notes. And I hope that you will join us at our one day event at RadCon. I cannot wait. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Oh my God. Thank you so much, girl. I so appreciate you having me on. And like I said, you're absolutely the freaking boundary boss queen. So being here and talking about mindset and boundaries and life with you has been such a freaking pleasure. Love it.